Hello everyone, I'm Nathan Lawrence, and thank you for joining me today for a, the first in a new series of videos that we will be doing called Nathan Talks. This is number one. This is a new concept for us, and this these talks will be a little bit more informal, a little bit more casual. They will still be biblically oriented, but we're going to be talking more from a whole life perspective. I am 60 years old. And um, I have uh, become a father and um, of a number of children, and I have uh, been married for many, many decades to my first and only wife. I have uh, been owning and uh, I've owned and operated a business which I started some 35 years ago, a family business. I pastored. I've been in ministry for 30 uh, years. I pastored for 18 years. I've traveled in many countries and in many states and have experienced many things. And I'd like to share a lot of my experiences from a biblical perspective and from a storytelling perspective. And I hope that you will find this approach to be interesting and maybe exciting and maybe even life changing for you. Um, eventually, it is my desire to open this up live stream it and maybe um, entertain questions and comments from people around the world who watch these videos and uh, participate in other aspects of our ministry, my blog, and read our articles on our website. Anyway, today Nathan, Nathan Talks, number one, I'm entitling it From Crippled to Walking, Leaping, and Praising Elohim. And this is a life story of mine that I've never really shared before. And I hope you will find it encouraging and exciting. I've always had a passion for climbing things, for getting up high. Maybe it's because I always wanted to get close to God, to Elohim, and He's up there. Ever since I was a little child, I wanted to draw closer to the Creator. Maybe I like getting high, climbing things, because I like the view from up there. It's a great view when you're up on top of a mountain or up in a tree or on a, um, some high place. You can see, gives you a perspective on life, an overview that I find very inspiring and mind-opening. Maybe it's because I like a challenge and a thrill. I've always been a little bit of a thrill seeker. I've done a lot of dangerous, what a lot of people call daring uh, kind of adventurous things. In fact, I have a profession that is very dangerous and very daring and very um, thrilling at all at the same time. I started climbing when I was one year old. Uh, when I was just a baby, I started to climb up a, a small tree in our yard and my mom freaked out. What's a baby climbing a tree? I don't think I was very high off the ground. I don't know. I don't remember. But my grandmother was there, and she told my mother, she says, Hey, don't worry about it. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> this is what I've been told, at least, uh, and that she said. And I don't know how my grandmother knew that. I don't know if she was speaking prophetically, or she just had an intuition. But she was right. Um, I eventually became a professional climber. So, and we'll talk about that. And what happened one point in time during one of my climbing adventures, which is where the crippling comes in. So, my first tree climbing experience when I was one year old began a whole series of, event, of events in my life which is the subject of this talk. Why am I sharing this with you? Well, simply this. In Psalm 78 in the Bible, the writer instructs us, Give ear, O my people, to my Torah law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. 
I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generations to come the praises of Jehovah, the Lord, and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done, that they should make them known to their children. that the generation to come might know them, that the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in Elohim and not forget the works of Elohim, but keep his commandments, and may not be like their fathers, and forget the works of Elohim, but keep his commandments. A generation that did not set their fathers were a generation, a stubborn and a rebellious generation that, not, that did not set their heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to Elohim. So I'm hoping that some of the words I'm about to speak, it's not only for my children and my children's children, but some of you out there, I hope and pray that you will find inspiration from my words and maybe cause you to think about your life and where you are going and where it may end up if certain things go a certain way or don't go a certain way and cause you to think about the bigger picture of life from the higher up perspective if you will. So here's my story. My first climb as a baby began a whole series of uh, climbing adventures that eventually led to a career as a professional tree pruner, tree climber, and eventually I started my own tree service, which I still own and operate to this day, nearly 35 years later. The following is, um, my, my climbing adventure came to a sudden and an injurious stop at the base of a tree in 1987. As a result, I was crippled for three long years from 1987 to 1990. The following is my story of how I went from being a potential bedridden amputee to running and leaping like the man that was miraculously healed in the book of Acts, in the Bible, chapter 2, the man that was healed by Peter the Apostle at, in Jerusalem at the beautiful gate. His story is my story because I was miraculous, miraculously healed also when there was no natural hope for me to ever walk again. I began serious, uh, serious tree climbing when I was in grade school, probably about you know, six or seven years old. I grew up on a farm, a family farm, fourth generation on the family farm, and we had trees, we had a forest, and I, I don't know when I began climbing trees. Anything I could get into, I climbed without any safety gear, without helmets or anything, ropes. I just climbed, I'd climb up and get as high as I could, and I'd look around, enjoy the view, and I'd climb back down, and I did that regularly. It was just, just an activity that I did. By the age of eight, um, I was skiing high up on Mount Hood, which is Oregon's tallest mountain, over 11,000 feet high. And I started skiing when I was eight. I was skiing at about the six, 7,000 foot level. And I've continued to ski to this day. And at, also at about age eight, uh, my dad uh, had me pruning in this big old giant apple tree that my grandfather planted on the family farm back in the 1920s. And this tree was a big old Gravenstein tree, Gravenstein apple tree. And it had, every year, it had a plethora of shoots. It was down in the sheep pasture by the uh, sheep barn on our farm. And I'd come home after school in the wintertime and I'd spend hours up in that tree with a lopping shears, cutting all those plethora of sprouts out and it seemed like it took days and days for me to get that done and I really didn't enjoy it it's something that I had to do it was one of my farm chores and my dad basically told me I had to do it so I did it and before you knew it I was pruning the neighbor's 
fruit trees also. I needed money. Uh, my, some of my neighbors who still had farms and fruit, old fruit trees, they found out I did tree pruning. And by age tw tr uh, 12, I had my own pruning business, pruning the neighbors' apple trees and other fruit trees. Um, also, at the age of 12, I climbed my first mountain. I climbed Mount St. Helens in 1972. That was eight years before it erupted and became the famous volcano that we've all heard about. And uh, my family had been mountain climbers for many, many years. My grandfather was, a, was an early mountain climber on Mount Hood. He started climbing Mount Hood before World War I um, and well before, uh, you know, over, well over 100 years ago. And he eventually became a professional mountain climbing guide, uh, climbing a lot of major mountains in the Pacific Northwest. And then he passed that on to, to my mother, and then my father became a mountain climber. And so the mountain climbing is in four, four generations of my family, including includes my children. And I, I you know, I... I, I, maybe some of the reason that I climb, like to climb, is because I have some of my grandfather's DNA in me. I don't know. So that was at age 12 when I climbed Mount St. Helens. By age 13, uh, we had a big old maple tree uh, in the cow pasture uh, uh, down by the old well house, the well that my grandfather hand dug. It's about 50 feet deep. And there was a big old multi, I had about seven big old trunks in it. And I built this tree house about 20 feet up in the, up in the, uh, between several of the trunks of the tree. And it was a two story tree house. And I built that when I was about 12 or 13 years old. And um, I would sleep up there. It had curtains and a window and gutters and it was kind of waterproof. And I hung out. It was kind of my man cave, except I was a kid. And I was pretty proud of that thing. By the time I was 15, I was backpacking in the high alpine country with my family um, uh, in the high alpine country of the Pacific Northwest, up around the five, six, seven thousand 7,000 foot level. That's when I started my backpacking career, way up in the mountains. And then by my late, by the time I was in my, I don't know, mid to late teens, my another grandfather of mine gave me a pair of old uh, climbing spikes, uh, spurs we call them. What uh, they were used for climbing telephone poles, and uh, he they were older than the hills, and and I had a, and he gave me a belt of what we call a flip line, a leather belt that would go around the the um, around the um, the telephone poles. So um, I one one day I got the nerve to strap those things on and. There was a tree, a big old maple tree up in one of our cow pastures by one of the old barns. And I climbed up that thing and I, and I was kind of scary, but I got up there and I got back down again. And, and um, anyway, that, was, that began my climbing career, if you will, with um, spurs. Uh, then I went to college uh, to become a journalist because you know, I grew up in, on the farm. We had a nursery. My dad had a landscaping business, so I was always working with plants and trees, climbing them and pruning them and that kind of thing. But that's not what I want to do for a career. I want to be a journalist. I was already writing for newspapers and, and uh, uh, you know, doing editing work and stuff. And that's what I want to do. So I studied uh, at a couple universities, several universities, and studied journalism. And uh, my third year of college, I um, uh, got the privilege of studying in Europe, in Switzerland, for a year. I studied at the uh, School of Modern French at the University of Lausanne, uh, full immersion for a year so I could learn that language. And, of course, what did I do uh, in my time off in between, you know, on, the, on weekends or, or during uh, vacation breaks? Well, you find me up in the Swiss Alps, climbing, hiking, skiing traveling around up there uh, and uh, you know just kind of in my blood this kind of thing but I really didn't want to be a climber I mean climbing I wanted to be a white collar professional you know a kind of a uh, more of an intellectual type person uh, I, f I enjoyed climbing I enjoyed tree work outdoor stuff but it was just a little bit too laborious grueling kind of a dirty work and uh, it was th fun thing to do but not what I want to do for my career so um, and guess what I did, you know, as I was working through college, through almost five years of college? Well, of course, I worked doing trees. That's how I paid my way. Uh, I worked in the family landscaping business, caring for trees, pruning trees and shrubs and plants and planting them. And, of course, that's what I did. And um, so, anyway, after I got done with my college career, I... Um, 
I continued to climb mountains. Uh, and right after out of college, I joined the Mazamas, which is the mountain climbing club in Oregon. It's the oldest mountain climbing club, I think, in the United States, if not North America. It was founded in the 19, uh, 1890s. And my grandfather was a mountain guide for that back in the early 1900s. Uh, um, and our family had a long history uh, in the Mazamas. My grandparents met in the Mazamas and got married. And, and so I'm a Mazama kid, if you will. So I, I, I joined the Mazamas where I took some climbing classes, tree uh, rock climbing and mountain climbing classes and as a result of that uh, I launched into a, um, um, a, a avocation a, a fun activity of climbing mountains when I say climbing mountains I'm not talking about little mountains I'm talking about you know seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thousand foot mountains most of them are glaciated and involve climbing on ice and snow and rock to get up there with all kinds of climbing equipment and so over a period of a number of years um, I made about 25 ascents of, of major mountain peaks in our region uh, so uh, you know it was in my blood and something I love to do but um, eventually when I graduated from college I couldn't make a career in journalism that just that dream kind of went away and so I had to make money, I had to earn a living. So I started working for my dad back in the landscaping business and after about a year or two of that, I decided to break off on my own and I started a, my own company when I was 25 years old in 1985. And it uh, eventually became a logging company. I had a lot of logging equipment and, and you know did logging, uh, removing of trees and all that on uh, big projects. And eventually it worked its way into, um, be I became a tree surgeon, a, uh, an arborist, a certified arborist even, a, um, uh, owned a tree care company. And so, you know, but the problem was, is that I didn't have any training. I had some mountain climbing, basic, you know, rock climbing. I knew a little bit about ropes and that kind of thing, rappelling. But how do you take that over into tree climbing? In those days, this was before YouTube, before the internet, before all this kind of thing, long before that. You, you know, you didn't learn how to be a tree climber. There weren't classes that were offered in the local community college. There weren't trade schools you could go to to learn how to climb trees professionally. Uh, the way you did it is you went to work for another tree service and you learned what they did. And then maybe you go off and start your own after you, you learn from them. Well, I didn't have anybody to learn from. So I kind of did it, had to do it the hard way by trial and error, taking some of my mountain and rock climbing experience and trying to adapt it into tree work. Well, it's a little bit different. Climbing trees recreationally, like I did when I was a kid, or climbing mountains and, and rock climbing and rappelling is a little bit different than climbing a tree, cutting it down and climbing it with chainsaws and <laughs> having to use ropes and that kind of thing. So. I didn't really have the right equipment and the right gear. In fact, my first chainsaw was a craftsman, little old used craftsman chainsaw, a little tiny thing that my grandfather gave me. And I busted, I think it fell out of a tree and I busted that thing and I wired, took some baling wire, wired, wired the handle back together and used that for a while until I, it just was too rickety. And so I finally saved up the money and went out and bought a brand new Shindaiwa, bright red, beautiful little Shindaiwa chainsaw. I was so proud of that chainsaw. It was powerful. It started. It was rugged. So one day, uh, this is in 1987, a couple years after I started my tree service, I'm up, up in a tree about 25, 30 feet up there, and I had employees who were helping me on the ground. We were cutting the tree down, then we were going to chip everything up and haul it off. And I was in the hills above Portland, and I lost my balance. Uh, it was a heavy chainsaw, and I was doing a one-handed thing with it, trying to cut some branches, and my chainsaw came down. I couldn't control it, and it cut my, my line that went around the tree. I was spurred in, but my flip line, my lanyard going around the tree to hold me there. And I free fell 25, 30 feet, and I landed on my left ankle. I'll show you a picture of that. It shattered it. I, I hit the root of a tree at the base of this tree and I, I, the, my, my ankle took the full force of that, of that um, fall. I landed, went back on my, uh, landed on, and I landed on my rear end and I went back and hit my head. I wasn't wearing a helmet. I didn't have anything. 
I didn't damage anything else in my body, but I shattered this ankle. The ankle was broken in 12 different places and numerous stress, stress, fact, uh, stress fractures. I didn't feel any pain when I hit the ground. I called my guys. I tried to move my, my leg. I knew it was broken. I couldn't move my, my foot or my ankle. And I was wearing these big boots. And so the, um, they called nine. My employees came down. I was on the ground. They called 911. The fire rescue people came. They, they had to lower me down off this bank out of this wooded area. They carted me off to the hospital. They cut my boot off of me. Um, my ankle was a mess. I wasn't bleeding, but it was a mess inside at least. I, they took me to the hospital. And interestingly enough, that particular night, the next, that night we were, my family and I, we were going to go up to Mount, Mount St. Helens and climb the mountain. This was in 1987, seven years after it blew its top in 1980. Now remember, Mount St. Helens was the first mountain. This is kind of a theme. It was the first mountain that I um, climbed in 1972 at age 12 years old. And we, and it blew up in 19. 80, just in our backyard, we, we saw it. We saw the smoke. It, the ash was coming down on us. It was quite a spectacle. And um, and then uh, the, the night after I fell, we were going to go up the next day and climb Mount St. Helens. My mom had gotten the permits from the Forest Service, and we were going to climb it for the first time since it blew its top. Well, obviously, the cl family climb was canceled because they were with me in the hospital. I got taken to the hospital, and and um, they took the x-rays. I was in a lot of pain by then. Uh, it seemed like I waited in the, um, they kept me in the um, emergency room for like hours. Finally, they got me on the operating table. It was six hours of operation. The doctor, the surgeon told my uh, my parents, you know, it's, so, it's the worst I've ever seen. Uh, that We might have to amputate the leg, but we're going to do the best we can. So they put in about a dozen pins and screws and plates and all kinds of titanium, molybdenum metal in there to put my ankle back together. And I was in the hospital for about a week and I was totally out of it. I was on, you know, painkillers. And after a week in the hospital, I, I was, you know, I was a bachelor. I was living on my own. I had my own um, home. Um, and um, I couldn't live on my own, so I moved in for a couple weeks with my parents. I was weak. I was bedridden. I couldn't even hardly get out of bed. I was so weak. Finally, after two weeks, I gained enough strength. I went back to my house. I couldn't drive my truck. It was a clutch. I couldn't push, push the clutch pedal on my truck with my left foot, so I had to buy an automatic, a little car. And as soon as I could, I was up on crutches. They had me in a cast electrical bone stimulating device on my leg to help facilitate the healing of the bone and next thing you know I'm out on my construction projects we're clearing land for builders and developers clearing subdivisions of timber I had a little logging company and I had employees and I'm hobbling around out there in the mud and in the muck trying to uh, you know trying to run my my show and the uh, I was going in every every month or so for um, checkups and to check and see how my my ankle was healing. Well, my ankle was starting to heal, but the main break in my tibia bone, my a main ankle bone, there was a major break there, and it just didn't want to heal. And after a year, I got off the cast. I was walking around with crutches, and that tibia bone was not healing. In about a year or so, um, they opened me up again. Uh, maybe it was a year and a half, I don't remember exactly. And they took out a bunch of the metal. But in the meantime, I was walking on the metal. I literally, I went skiing. I went climbing. I climbed Mount Hood again. Uh, I backpacked. I, one day I hiked 18 miles up in the mountains. All on a broken leg, held together by titanium, molybdenum, um, you know, metal. Uh, I literally busted that metal to pieces. They they uh, opened me up. They checked checked me out. Opened me up. Took them bunch of the metal out. I still have some in there. And and then let me go. They did a second bone graft. They they took a piece of, of a, a piece of bone out of my hip and tried to graft it together. That they done it the first time. They tried to do it the second time, uh, hoping that that tibia would. Uh, heal. 
So after about another year after that, the x-ray showed that it wasn't healing. The doctor could still take my ankle bone and there was gelatinous material in there, but he could still move it back and forth. Meanwhile, I'm climbing trees, uh, you know, trying to strengthen that ankle up. So, and I'm running around wearing these logging boots to give me ankle support. And uh, I don't know how I did it, but I did. Um, so in almost three years after I fell, they were talking about, um, I fell in July of 1987, and in about April of 1990, I went to the doctor for my regular checkup, and he could still do this with my ankle bone, almost three years later. And um, the other breaks had healed, but not the main ankle bone break. He said, he told me, he said, Nathan, I've got... An, um, another surgery scheduled for you in a couple weeks. Uh, we're going to try another bone graft. And I asked him, I said, what makes you think what the third time is going to work? You've tried it twice before. And he says, I don't know. We're going to try it. I said, I want a second opinion. So I went to another doctor for another surgeon, uh, orthopedic surgeon, and they told me, they told me, that, you know, they gave me the same diagnosis. So I went to some other doctors, chiropractic, naturopathic type doctors, and they didn't have any answers. So I went back to my surgeon and I said, look, I'm not going to be cut into again. Thank you, but I'm done. And he said, if you're not back, and, I, and he says, well, wh what are you going to do? And I said, Jesus is going to heal me. I had decided I was not going to be cut into again. I was decided that I was going to seek a healing, a divine healing from, a miraculous healing from Yeshua. I called him Jesus at the time. And he looked at me and he says, if you're not back in here in six weeks, you're going to be crippled for the rest of your life. He didn't say it in those words. He said, you're going to have a, another ankle joint. <laughs> Basically, you're going to be crippled for the rest of your life. And I said, you know, gee, thanks, Doc. And I walked out. I don't think I thanked him, but <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm done. God bless him. He did a great job, but I'm done. There's nothing more he can do. They're just experimenting on me now. Well, one little thing happened before I went into the, the doctor. So I never watched very much TV, hardly ever, but being a bachelor for seven years, now and again I'd turn on the TV, <coughs> and um, I had this little tiny TV that I got from Kmart. It was a 12-inch black and white TV. I paid $50 for that thing, and that was my TV. Well, I decided to, in my 1990, I said, I'm going to splurge. I'm, I'm home alone a lot, most nights, and I'm kind of lonely. So I went to Sears, and I bought this bigger TV, as a, about this size, a full-color TV. And one day, I'm in, and it had the channels that went higher. I think my little TV only went up to, like, channel 12 or something, my little black and white. But this one went up. So I'm thumbing through the dials, and I'm like, oh, what are these other channels up here? I got up to channel 24. It was a Christian channel, the Pentecostal Christian channel, TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network, and it just happened that Trinity Broadcasting Network had just opened up a TV station in Portland, Oregon, just like a month or two before that, a station KNMT, and I just happened to turn it on. I'd never watched this before. I didn't know, even know it existed. I'd never been in a, in a regular church before. I'd never heard of these guys. I'd never heard of a televangelist. I I was totally clueless about that. I was in a church. We were in our own little world. And so I'm listening to these Pentecostal faith healers, these big names that a lot of you have heard. And I'm like, huh, I've never heard this before. And they're talking about healing. And I started listening to them and it kind of inspired me a little bit. And so I I didn't necessarily believe. I was a Bible student. I'd been reading the Bible every day since I was like eight or nine. And I knew my Bible pretty well, uh, and by this time I'd been studying it for, you know, 20, 25 years. And uh, so, um, they said a lot of things I didn't really agree with, but they said one thing. They said, find the Bible verses in the Bible that talk about healing, the promises, and um, stand on them and believe them, and you will be healed. Well, they kind of indicate that you'll be healed instantly, but I knew the Bible well enough that the promises of Elohim, there's not a time factor on them. Yeah, their promises are true, but he doesn't say when you're going to be healed. So I realized 
I might be healed instantly. I might be healed sometime during my life. Or if I'm not healed during my life, I'll be healed at the resurrection, at the second coming of the Messiah, when I get my resurrected body. Either way, whatever happens, I will be healed because His Word cannot lie. It is a true promise from Elohim. And so, I had faith in that. I wanted to be healed now. I didn't want to go through my life crippled, but I said to the Lord, I said, if I have to go through life crippled, I'm willing to do that. It's going to change my life big time, but you'll give me the grace, and somehow I will bring glory to you, and you'll use me for your glory, and I trust that. Well, I have another confession I, I need to make. So anyway, so I wrote down all these Bible verses, and I began to stand on them and believe them and confess them and pray them every single day. So I have another confession to make. Here's this mighty man of faith, this godly man, the man of the Bible. <laughs> not, um, well, not as much as I, I should have been. Believe it or not, I had received some healings before when I was a kid. That's a whole other story. Uh, but this was the biggest thing that ever happened in my life, injury-wise. But I never had anybody pray for me. When I fell out of that tree, nobody prayed for me. I didn't ask the people, the elders or the ministers in my church to pray for me. Nobody prayed for me. I didn't, didn't even occur to me. I hate to admit it, but it didn't. But when I got to 1990 and I had no options, all of a sudden I realized I got to look up. I'm, I'm like at the bottom of the pit. I have to look up. So I went to church. It was uh, we were we had just done a, a Passover seder, uh, Passover service actually in our in our little home fellowship that we were uh, my my dad had, and I had him and one of the other uh, men, one of the elders, pray over me. And that was after I went out of the doctor's office. Well, I believed that I would be healed, but I didn't know when. Well, honestly. After I prayed, they prayed over me, and I began to confess the scriptures, and I walked out of the doctor's office. Guess what? My ankle got worse. It got a lot worse. I started getting these shooting dagger-like pains in my ankle, like like knives. I got them like once a day, and I'd, I'd, I'd be walking all of a sudden, and it would just like hit me, like, oh, I have to stop, and I'd just like, oh. It would last for like, you know, not very long, maybe half a minute or something, uh, and and it would go. Like happened every single day. I, I think it was a test of my faith. I, I think it was a fiery dart of Satan. You know, the book of Ephesians chapter five talks about the fiery darts of the devil. I, I don't know if it was, or maybe I think that's actually Ephesians six, but I don't know what it was, but it tested my faith. But I kept my focus on the on the promises in the Bible and I did not let that dissuade me because I didn't have any choice, to be honest with you. I didn't have any choices. In this, I, if you were going to receive a divine healing, or I was going to be crippled. I knew that. So this went on. These dagger shooting pains went on for six weeks, and then they stopped. And then all of a sudden, I got this deep itching feeling down deep in my ankle. I hadn't had that before. Now I knew from as a kid that sometimes when you get a big sore or a a wound on your flesh wound, and when it starts to itch, that means it's healing. I, I, I knew that. So I knew that it was healing, and I'd scratch it and scratch it and scratch it, and I couldn't itch it because I couldn't it, I couldn't satisfy that itch because it was deep, deep in my ankle. And that went on for another month. It, it'd just be times when it would just itch like crazy. So it was now two and a half months. By this time, it was June of 1992, about two and a half months after I walked out of the doctor's office. And I'm, out, I'm, I'm, one day I got up in the mountains to, I just wanted to be alone. I went way up in my car, up in the mountains. I'm walking around with a cane and I got leather, heavy duty uh, ankle support boots, you know, like, uh, like lineman, leather lineman logging type boots. I, I wore those because they gave my ankle support and less pain. So I'm up in the mountains one day. Um, on a back road that was abandoned. I was up about the 6,000 foot level in the mountains down in the high Sierras of Nevada. And I'm sitting on a granite boulder reading my Bible, praying. I wasn't even thinking about my ankle. I was just worshiping God, Elohim, just enjoying the scenery, looking out over the valley down below. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, 
it hit me. I didn't hear an audible voice. I just had this deep knowing, this gift of faith. I knew that I was healed. I just knew that I knew that I knew that I was healed. I was full of joy and I said, thank you, Lord. I didn't feel any anything. I didn't feel anything in my ankle. I just knew. I jumped down off that boulder and ran up to my car and I came home. And it just so happened that my mom had finally, three years after I fell, she got around to getting a permit to climb Mount St. Helens again. Good old Mount St. Helens. It kind of figures prominently in this story. And I came home and I said, hey, I'm going to climb Mount St. Helens with you guys. I, sh I said, I'm healed. She said, what? They were going to climb in July of 1990. And this was June of 1990. I said, I'm healed. She says, if you climb Mount St. Helens, they're going to have to take you down with a helicopter. I said, Mom, I'm healed. I said, I'm going to climb that mountain. She said, no, you are. I said, yes, I am. She said, well, go back and get an x-ray from your surgeon. I said, I'm not going back to that faithless man. Um, she said, okay, go to our chiropractor. He was a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. I said, okay, I'll go there. His name was Dr. Bell. So I went to Dr. Bell, and I've got all of my testimony is on x-ray. I've got three years of x-ray films here with my ankle and my name on these. And I'm going to put some of these up. You'll see them here um, on the on the video. Oh, one other little thing I forgot to tell you. See this? This is one of the pieces of metal that they took out of my ankle. This is a three inch titanium molybdenum screw. This was holding my ankle into place. And when the, the second surgery I had, I, um, well, actually it was after that, they decided it was sticking out of my, a little bit out of my ankle. You could feel it under the flesh. So he cut me open. I watched him when he did it. <laughs> he cut me open and he took a screwdriver and screwed this thing out of my ankle. It was quite an amazing thing. I wish I would have had a video. I could have videotaped it. That would be an interesting one. But anyway, that was back in 19, uh, I don't know, 89 when that happened. Um, we didn't have uh, we didn't have smartphones back then where we could videotape everything. But anyway, so I went to Dr. Bell. He took a an X-ray, and sure enough, my ankle was healed. the The crack was gone, and I'll show you the I'll show you the videos. You'll see them here. There's just a little bit of shading in the video uh, or in the. Uh, not the video, but the, the x-ray, a little bit of a shading where there was still some inner healing going on inside the bone. But by and large, it was healed. So guess what? I went and climbed Mount St. Helens. And that was in 1990. And now this is, uh, what, 30 years later. And I have climbed thousands and thousands of trees. I have run I have skied, I have mountain climbed, I've backpacked all over the mountains, I have jumped and run and you know, you name it. And I have not had any problems, the rest is history, hallelujah. Um, I give my Elohim all the praise and the glory. So what is the takeaway from all of this? What is the lesson in this that I hope to inspire you and leave you with? It is this. Life is precious. Each step, each breath, every heartbeat of ours is a gift from the Almighty Creator, Yehovah Elohim. In the, the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible, Solomon likened our lives to a silver thread which is easily snapped or to a a clay water pitcher that's on the edge of, a, of a, a cistern, a well, that could easily fall off the ledge and be shattered. That's what our lives are like. We never know which breath will be our last, when our heart will stop ticking, or when something unexpected will happen to us. Like me, I'm cutting a tree and next thing I know, I'm falling, free falling to the ground. Um... And as a result, my life was changed forever. It, if it had not been for the merciful grace of my Yehovah Elohim on my life and my faith in Yeshua the Messiah, my Lord and Savior, and His healing promises in the Bible, I'd be crippled to this day. I'd be waiting for my resurrected body 
at the second coming, my new recreated body. What is the point? Look, my dear friends, I'm nobody special. What he did for me, he can do for anyone, including you. If you will only believe him, put your faith and trust in him, and obey Yehovah Elohim and Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord and Savior. You know, not everybody receives their healing in this lifetime. Everybody has to die. Things happen. But many people do receive healings. Whether you receive it in this life or whether you receive it in the next life, the promises of Elohim are sure. You can count on them. I am walking proof of that. I'm inspired by what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 37. He says, The steps of a good man are ordered by Jehovah, by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Yes, I fell 25 feet, or 30 feet. I didn't measure it. It was up there somewhere. But I was not utterly cast down. I stumbled, but I did not utterly fall. It did not destroy me. It strengthened my faith. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for Jehovah upholds him with his hand. I have been young, and now I am old. I am sixty years old, and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging for bread. My dear friends, I stood on that pro those promises in the word of Elohim years ago when I was crippled, and I'm still standing on them to this day. I have told this story to hundreds and hundreds of people. I went back to the surgeon and told the story to the surgeon that worked on me. I told it to his partner, who he was also knew about me. Uh, they were part, uh, partners in, in their surgical practice. I told my story to the nurse that was there uh, waiting on the surgical nurse. I've told my story to the anesthesiologist and to hundreds of other people. And now I'm, I'm telling my story to you, hoping that this will inspire you to have faith in the Creator. He will hear you if you call out to him. He is there. His word is true. His promises are good. And they are for you. And I hope you can receive this and be inspired by this message. And really make it a part of your life. And help move your life in a very positive, um, healing, restoring, life-giving direction. Hallelujah and praise His name. Amen.